What's up, everybody? This is Ralph Amsden, co-host of the Seatown Rivals podcast. We're about to be joined by Brett Quintine and Chili to talk about last week's action in Chandler area football. But before I do that, just a reminder that the Seatown Rivals podcast is brought to you by ArizonaVarsity.com, the Rivals affiliate site covering all Arizona high school football and basketball in the state of Arizona. You can support us by becoming a subscriber. Just jump on to ArizonaVarsity.com, and if you're not already a subscriber, uh, go ahead and subscribe. It costs about $8.33 a month to support all that we do. Subscribing to Arizona Varsity helps us bring you content just like what you're about to listen to. We are also part of the ArizonaSportsCast.com podcast network. ArizonaSportsCast.com hosts podcasts covering Chandler area football, like you're about to listen to with the Seatown Rivals podcast, as well as high school sports from around the state, the Arizona State Sun Devils, the Phoenix Suns, and Arizona Cardinals. So if you could go ahead and search for Arizona Sportscast on iTunes, become a subscriber, leave a review, that would be fantastic. Without further ado, let's get you to this week's episode of the Seatown Rivals podcast. season is complete and as always it was another fun year. All but one of the teams we cover qualified for the postseason and even they finished at the 500 mark. The Battle of Arizona Avenue is certainly something special and perhaps it's a prelude to the state title game. Perhaps. Five wins and three losses was the tally for the Chandler area team, so let's dive in. Brett Quintana, as always, joined by Ralph Amson and Chile, and we talk solid football across the board. Three, four, five, and the 6A levels. Let's start off with the Arizona College Prep Knights, as they hung a donut on the Knights of Gilbert Christian 21-0. One touchdown in each of the back three quarters was the difference in the game, and those TD tallies were all passes from Mark Chavez. Two of them hauled in by Bryson, excuse me, Brian Dyson, and ACP finishes at 8-2. and two. Chili, just a phenomenal season so far. Man, I'm super impressed by the victory because I know that uh, Gilbert Christian had two solid running backs most of the season. Um, so to be able to beat them 21 to nothing and, you know, obviously control both sides of the game, uh, offense and defense, I, I, great job. And I saw Coach Blueford at a, at a Chick-fil-A on Saturday. So, yeah, um, good guy, and I love what he's doing with the program over there. Speaking of running into the staff, I ran into their defensive line coach at Zips on Friday night. Blueford was out there too, and, and he told me, you know, that they their D coordinator didn't really even get on until second, third week of the season to oh, wow. install stuff. Um, and also said that, like, that, that uh, the ALA Gilbert North loss isn't necessarily what it looked like. They, they weren't 100% healthy. Um, and he thinks that they have a genuine shot at, at doing some damage if they get an opportunity um, to, to to replay that game. And so, you know, this is a confident team that's doing some really, really special stuff. And, I mean, I'm I'm interested to see, you know, it's they're kind of in a why not us uh-huh, position, absolutely. right? I mean, that, they, they, could, they could do a little something in the playoffs. And I think that there's a way that people look at you when you make the playoffs and there's a way that people look at you when you can win in the playoffs and agree it's a great point you know if they if they can accomplish both of those in the same season then they have definitely arrived i mean that's like castile status right uh-huh. that's like right. like hey you just learned our name and now you have to remember it because we're really here very true and they claim the number 12 seed in 3a they'll face another eight and two team in the first round of the playoffs and that is the blue ridge yellow jackets winnable game yes i've seen i have seen blue ridge play they're they're not, and I I know P, P J London is a, is a really good three A player. He's their quarterback, and he can um, do some damage on the defensive side of the ball as well. They play well as a team, but they don't have a lot of numbers. Okay, and if you've got athletes, uh huh, you you can beat them. I mean, what Florence was like three and something, or maybe four and six this year. They had that huge win over, over A L A Queen Creek. Yes. But I mean, they they got 
absolutely destroyed in some other games, but I watched them get out in front of Blue Ridge and actually left the game, assuming they were going to blow Blue Ridge out. Sure. Blue Ridge came back and won. So that, that's a t- you have to be if if you were going to get your foot on the neck of Blue Ridge, like you you have to Got be it. merciless because sense. they you know they're just going to run their offense. They're going to do what they do. They're probably the first White Mountain team outside of Sholo, who is actually the staff at ALA Gilbert North. Ah, um, okay. Outside of Sholo, that actually throws the ball. You know, so they're a White Mountain team with a multifaceted offense. You have to be ready for that, but a lot of their stuff is just long passes to the outside, rolling the quarterback out. And so if you can find a way to pressure him, cut off his rollouts, and then you can do what you do on offense. Yeah, I, I promise you, this is a winnable game. Good. No, definitely good to hear. The Valley Christian Trojans, as we stay in 3A, they conclude their regular season at 8-2, and two, and they've won their last four after defeating Fountain Hills 49-23. A couple of guys had great games on the ground. Vinny Legata, 112 yards and a pair of scores, and a name we haven't spoken about, Tony Gomez, 116 yards and two touchdowns. Ralph, whether by air or by land, Kirk Sundberg's team got it done. Yeah, and uh, and Fountain Hills, you know, they're... they're uh... They're kind of like the, the with the Maricopa of the Northeast, I guess. Okay, that's fair. You know, it's it's out there. You got to pass a casino to get there. You know, <laughs> and it, a little bit of desert, but it, but it 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 actually is like a self-contained community with a fairly like big school that has been successful at this level in multiple sports, and they have a couple of really good athletes. I think we did a film session on their middle linebacker, Momo. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they, they're they tough, you know, and they put points up on, I think, everybody they've played this year. Haven't done a whole lot defensively, and so it's good that they were able to get in there and take care of business. I think that that gives them some momentum into the playoffs. Vinny Legata kind of needs to be healthy for them, to, for this whole thing um, to, to work in the first place. And, you know, they, they, they've shown that they can win, like, low-scoring, tighter games, defensive battles. They've shown that they can outscore you. Um, you know, the the one thing that they, you know, have really struggled with is is getting over the hump against the big brand-name schools uh-huh. of, of the Which 3A. Is a team that awaits them in the postseason. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I think everybody's going to point to the previous matchup and say, you know, Yuma Catholic won big, but... Um, that was also McFarland's first game for Yuma Catholic. Like and, Justin Simpson said, like right. we could not have, there was no film to right. prepare us for And that. now that people have seen him a little bit, like his stats have kind of, you know, gone down a little bit. You know, he r- rushed for 310 against Valley Christian. The second game, I think it was like 250. And then he went like 40 and 40. Like, you know, a solid player. But I think, you know, now that everybody has seen him a little bit, I think it's going to be a little bit easier to, you know, game plan for something like that. So you're not just game plan for Gage Reese and then all of a sudden, bam, like get hit in the face with a, you know, a power tailback yeah. or whatever. So yeah, Vinny Legato was knocked out of that game as their quarterback in the second uh-huh. quarter. He played a little bit of defense, but he, he was not what he was not available for them in the Correct. second half. And I do like, and I'm normally not, you know, um, an advocate of like this dual quarterback thing, but do I do like that? You know, Sunberg has you know Legata and Hansel. You know, yep, a couple know, guys who can sling it. Obviously, we've seen throws. guys who can rush it as well and throw it. No, you're absolutely right. He's gonna have two thousand yard throws, and hey, the squad looks good. I like what Sunberg's doing. He can do no wrong, even though I don't like the two headed quarterback thing. He does it, and I like it, so it's all good. Sounds like a plan. Yuma Catholic, the Shamrocks, they're actually the last team to beat Valley Christian. They did so on October fourth, fifty four to twenty eight. If I'm correct, this is the first time since we've been doing this podcast that Valley Christian has gotten a playoff berth in back-to-back seasons. The Seton Catholic Sentinels, their year comes to a conclusion after being outscored by the Poston Butte Broncos 48-42. Seton Catholic was 5-2 and two after seven games, and they lost their last three. Pete Walheim, we definitely thank you for letting us into your program. Fellas, I'll just kind of let you guys sum up your thoughts on the 2019 Sentinels. Um, I know Castro didn't do much damage or any damage at all. Uh, Keyshawn Upchurch got the opportunity, took the ball, uh, rushed for 120 yards. I'm curious where that has been all season because we were talking about, you know, a compliment for we Castro. Would, yes. Um, you know, and we kind of thought that he would be the guy coming yeah. into the year, not so much Castro. And also, you know, I mean... I know that uh, Seton kind of hit hit a little uh, skid, starting with the loss of Flagstaff. That I know Ralph thinks that they should have won. Um, they should they definitely should have beat you know, Flagstaff. You should beat Flagstaff, and then you obviously you run into that you know steamroller Saguaro, and then you lose this heartbreaker to Post and Butte, but you can't give up 350 yards to any running back. And 
win a game. So, I mean, right. it's, it's just tough the way Seton had to end that season because they get that win versus Flagstaff, they're probably in. Uh-huh. That's very true. And probably two of the biggest upsets in 4A, you know, I'd say that two of the biggest, of the five biggest upsets in 4A have come at the hands of Seton Catholic over the last two seasons because they knocked Peoria oh, out of the that's playoffs. Right, last year, yeah. Uh, who, who I believe Wild was like scoring game. One yes, the yes, they were. They knocked Peoria out of the playoffs, and then... That was you know, a 13-4 matchup. Yeah, and that then... Sounds they, right. yeah, I right. think they were down 12-0 when I, when I left the game uh, against Mesquite, and it looked like they were going to get wrecked, and they came back and they... Won that game. I was able to check in on Seton twice this year, and uh, I saw them for a total of uh, almost four quarters, and never once saw them score on offense. That's funny. And so you know, maybe maybe the problem was me. But I but that Flagstaff game, I think that that that's that's got to be one that sticks with them because you know not only did they have a lead and surrender it to an inferior team, they then took that lead back on a fumble return for a touchdown, then got an interception mm-hmm. on the very next drive. And weren't able to weren't able to put the game away, especially considering that they had driven all the way inside, I believe, the fifteen, um, and and weren't able to finish a drive that would have won the game there at the end. And so, uh, I just um, I think that you know that, that they're going to have a long off season, mm-hmm. and, and hopefully that it drives them to to get a little bit better because you know they're they're not. They're not like a senior laden team. They've got some good seniors, um, but you know they, they will have some talent coming back, um, and potentially they'll be rid of some of their more difficult opponents um, who who might be bumped up to five A in the next scheduling block. We you know we have yet to see that, but they'll they'll at least probably be able to count on not having to lose to Saguaro sixty something to nothing. You know, every single year, which has been a which has been mm-hmm. kind of a sore spot for them because it comes at the end of the year and it right. leaves them beat up. Mm-hmm. And I think two years in a row they've come that off the right. the Saguaro loss and lost a game they probably should have won the very next week. Sounds right. Now I'll say the one thing you mentioned that they uh, a lot of optimism, a lot of guys coming back. More than likely, we anticipate Pete Walheim coming back because this is one of those scenarios that we've seen three different coaches. Three different years, so when you have your coach coming back and some guys, there's reason to uh, to really be optimistic over at 1150 North Dobson. It's always a job that I'm shocked that it ever comes open in the first uh-huh. place. Yeah, I'm, you know, I, they got two sophomores. They got their quarter, they got a new quarterback coming in. Obviously, La Licata's going to leave. I mean, it, it's just tough. Five and five, I think, was uh, you know a great season for them, just in the sense that you know they lost Vince Wallace. Yep, Vin, Vince Wallace was huge for that team. He was literally the heartbeat of that team last year and you lose him you lose your coach you got a lot of transition um and you know like you said we thought that Upchurch was going to be the guy coming in and you know Castro steps up and he takes over and you know they got they got another quarterback another uh, 2022 kid so I, th- I think the foundation over there is uh, going to be okay outstanding and the Castile Colts they're playing well. Three straight wins to wrap up the regular season, this time blowing out Campo Verde 42-17. Quarterback Dane Christensen, 27 of 33, good for 461 yards and four touchdowns. Nice, real nice. Chile with Isaiah Newcomb and Dominic DeGian, each with 100 yards receiving. It's no wonder that they've scored at least 40 points in each of their last three games and also have scored in 14 straight quarters. Yeah, this team is loaded with talent, man. And this, this, like I know that everybody was talking, and I was one of them talking about the exodus and stuff, man. Coach Newcomb can coach, and those uh-huh. kids like they they bought in and they believe. Um, like I said, you know, one of my favorite players on that team, uh, Colin Gapen. I, I know that he had almost 100 yards receiving last week. Um, this this Campbell Verde team is tough. They 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 weren't in the open for like three four weeks for nothing. Right. So it, it's a quality victory. Um, Man, I I just can't. Castile, like they, I don't want to say that they surprised me, but man, like no, I'll be I, the first to say they surprised me. I mean, se- yeah. se- seven and three, like it, it's good because you know? this is a team that could go further than last year's edition with Gunnar Cruz and company. And I, the I thought road this is set up nicely. I thought the transition would just be a little bit tougher with all the departures and stuff, Gunnar Cruz especially. But mm-hmm. man, uh, what Christensen has done is you know. Not, nothing short of awesome, you know, and he's going to get another year. We're going to get to watch this yes. special kid play another year, so, I mean, it's cool. 
This is something I got to look into, but I'm I, I would imagine that it's fairly rare for a five A team, much less a Santan region team, to have twenty five hundred yards passing and two thousand yards rushing in huh. a in in a season. I mean, those are true. especially most of these Santan region teams. You know, it's it's a one or both yes. type deal. It's very possible that the the Spencer Brash, um, Drayson Hall duo. Uh, did something close to that, but that would have been in, in the 4A, in the 4A mm-hmm. before moving up to 5. And so I, I want to look a little bit more into that, but this is a team that threw for 2,500 yards, 73% completion percentage, uh, only eight turnovers on the wow. entire year, so less than – so they're, they're taking care of the ball. They can do a little bit of both. Um you know, and I think that you know, defensively, early on against some of the weaker opponents, is where they were really able to get in in the backfield. But they did enough to win, you mm-hmm. know, later on. And they are missing a bunch of players who 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 probably would have added to this team and maybe even made them a, a, a title contender. Dominant, but yeah. you know, I think that they're also you can throw them into being in like why not us category uh, right now as well because you know they it's it's not like they they got destroyed. They definitely got beat. Um, by Higley and by and by Williamsfield, but they but they didn't get destroyed. Correct. And we saw you know Same with the other loss Centennial. Yeah, they, was, they got beat. That they did not get destroyed. Oh yeah, yeah, they were. Well, I think they had a lead, or it was tied in the fourth quarter. Um, the I think the good thing about this um, Castile team is, well, I think we were shown last year that. <laughs> we were shown last year that it is very tough to win twice uh-huh. against the same team. Uh, in in five A and so uh, you know I, I think that they'll be pr- they're obviously they're going to be well prepared they've got some they've got some tools in in the toolbox I think that what it's really going to come down to um, you know uh, they've, they've got some special teams issues out there they're like one for six in field goals on the year right. so if it's a close game right that can know, be concerning that, sure yeah that but. But other than that, I mean, mm-hmm. th- this has been a really good team. They've withstood some injuries, as Chili has pointed out, and it feels like maybe they're getting a little bit healthier going into the playoffs. Yeah. So, you know, could they contend for a conference championship? I don't, I don't, I don't want to like. I, I can't I rule them out. I was gonna yeah. say we can't discount that. No, yeah, but I, mean, I wouldn't confidently say I, I'm not gonna stand out there and say like they're one of the three teams that I think will get there, but if they're there at the end, like we none of us are gonna be surprised. Correct. Seven wins, three losses. They are the number four seed in three A. They could go a long way. The road begins with a home game on Friday night against Ironwood Ridge. The Basha Bears, they fall victim to the Perry Pumas in their regular season finale, 31-7. The Bears struck first as Josh Sink hit Zion Williams with a touchdown pass, and the game was actually tied at seven after two quarters. 21 fourth quarter points spelled victory for Perry. Ralph, a real balanced offense. Chuppa with 209 in the air and 206 on the ground. Poof. I, <laughs> enjoy, it, enjoy it while you can. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's been a special few years with the Purdy brothers playing quarterback out of Perry, and that's all, you know, that that's all coming to an end. Sure. <laughs> you know, it's just up to, it's really up to Perry how long of an ending and how long of a curtain call, you know, this is. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like they're trending downward a little bit heading into the playoffs. I feel like they're getting more wrapped up in their identity of, you know, it's all Purdy all the time instead of less, instead of more weapons um, revealing themselves. Although that one, the one slot receiver. Jaden Young. Jordan Young. Jordan Young, rather. No, 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 no. The one who went off against Chandler out of nowhere. And then Max, Uh, is it Berger? uh, Cade Berger? Cade Berger. Berger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So his emergence is pretty great Mm -hmm. um, for them. Uh, and then, obviously, you know, Brock Lane playing defense, I think, you know, shores up some of the issues that this team has has had. Um, I'm just – I I picked them in the beginning of the year to be there in the end in the 6A conference playoffs. Um, they can still map out that way. I, yeah, I'm, I'm sticking with it. Mm-hmm. I'm sticking with it. I, I, I honestly – I think Chubba Purdy is that – special of a player, you know, and he's not doing it by himself. And so, you know, if it, if it makes it feel like I'm saying he's doing it by himself, obviously, like, that offensive line is, sure. is helping. Um, but, you know, uh, it, the numbers speak to somebody who has way more to do with the offense 
proportionally Absolutely. than most quarterbacks Very in the true. state. And that's just the number. Like this, That's just what it is. And if you've seen him play, you know. Uh-huh. You that's know right. how special he is. So I, I think that they could still get there. I I really do. Um, you know, who's the number two seed? Brophy they beat. Brophy is two, yeah, and the number one seed, Brophy. Red Mountain, they beat. Yeah, so, so they yeah, got victories all the time. They'll have two home games, potentially. I think it's fair to call them the 6A favorite going in. Uh, I mean, they've got a lot going for it. Desert again. Ridge is like lava hot right uh-huh. now, but that's not a team that I don't I don't know if they could keep up with Chuba if he's in a mood. Correct. You know? I mean, we'll have to see what, uh, for argument's sake, let's assume Desert Ridge, excuse me, Desert Vista goes ahead and beats Basha. I mean, we never take anything for granted, and here at the Seatown Rivals podcast, we certainly root for the CUSD teams, but a Desert Vista Perry quarterfinal intrigues me. Those Grubs boys, I mean, they could present potential problems for Perry. So we'll uh, we'll see. Obviously, that's jumping up to the second round. But uh, if you're a Perry Puma fan, you certainly have to like the road that they have. Two home games, potentially, and then on track to play two teams that you've beaten already. The Hamilton Huskies and the Chandler Wolves, wow. 42-38 is the final. The Chandler Wolves are victorious. 23 wins in a row. They've scored at least 30 in each of those games. Davion Hunter, four rushing touchdowns, 207 yards. Great game. That's obviously an understatement. Mikey Keene doing his thing in the air. And even a guy we haven't talked much about, Isaiah Collison, found the end zone as well, Chili. Nicky Friday, man. Uh, that quarterback uh, from Hamilton, Nick Friday, Nicky Friday, he's special. He's so good. Um, and he didn't, do, he didn't do it by himself, but he managed a great game. And he... Got his team in a position to win. Uh-huh. Um, man, it, it was it was everything that I thought it would be. Um, <laughs> Day Day Hunter is special. Uh-huh. It's the second time I've seen him play, and um, he that 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 kid's a good a good ball player. I cannot. I am stunned that he doesn't have more offers. Stunned now. Um, you know, yeah, I, wa- I, wa- I wanted to, I wanted to see him against a team like Hamilton, yep. a team with a solid defense. Sure. And not that Brophy didn't have a solid defense. Right, but, but no, you wanted to see I wanted again. to see him in that rivalry game uh, where it was uh, going to be very, very hostile, where those dudes wanted to get him. And, man, 200 he yards. Up. Uh, that 54-yard run was crazy. Um, man, that, man, that boy's good. Mm-hmm. And also on the other side, uh, Armenta. Armenta for Hamilton's a uh-huh. you know workhorse, and you know I love Brendan Rice. Uh, I thought what he they did call a great him, two job. three go crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> him cool. and uh, him and Dorman. Yes. Um, yeah, man. Um, the game was everything that I, that I thought it would be. Um, there's yeah, there's not much else to say. Keon Gray's is special, the wide receiver. I know uh-huh. he had a big game, and um, yeah, the defense is. I know they gave. Up, I know they kind of gave up a lot of points, but that Chandler defense. This is the best Chandler defense I've ever seen. Ever seen. Definitely good or stuff. Or Romney now, Reed. Like I'll say. So Chandler has uh, not Chandler. Hamilton's next opponent will be Centennial. That's in a couple of weeks. This game, at least, and I was not at the game, so all I can do is just look at the videos and the highlights. It kind of reminded me of when Hamilton and Centennial got together last in that quarterfinal in which Centennial on Hamilton's field scored 27 fourth quarter points. Hamilton had a sizable lead against Chandler and I can't say they blew it. It's Chandler coming back. Yeah. But it's like it's one of those things where if you're the Hamilton Huskies in order to go deep, you're going to have to close the door, and it certainly will begin in two weeks at Centennial. In Arizona, I've only picked against Chandler twice. Uh, last year, Highland, and then this year, Hamilton. And, um, you know, I think, and I'm guessing that Mikey Keene took a lot from that, that Highland experience watching Jacob Conover uh-huh. and applied it, you know, to get his own comeback victory, you know, to... You know, make that happen. And, you know, Mikey Keene is a super special quarterback. He can do yep. so many things. He almost had 300 yards passing. And I know yes, I know, Chandler kind of came out of the gate sputtering. They were down 28-14 at halftime. Mm-hmm. And then uh, later in the game, they were down 35-21, I believe, mm-hmm. is what you were referring to earlier. So, you know, 
they, they've shown now that, you know, they can get punched in the face and come back, and now they're showing it, like, before, like, the playoffs even start. So, like, sure. you know, I think, I think this is good for them because they didn't need any more blowouts. They needed somebody to kind of test them and challenge them. And it is very, very possible they're going to see Hamilton again. That would be very nice if we got to see them on December 7th. It would be a little bit bigger stage. Yeah, stage I got I got to shout out my two uh, 2023 kids, uh, Cole Martin, uh, Wyatt Milkovic. Those, hey, those boys, they're going to be something special for years. So I'll give you some of my thoughts on this game. Yes. Um, the way that uh, the way that uh, Dorman and Armenta just go after the yards that are there uh, was huge. Uh, I think that you know Chandler's defensive line uh, overcommitted quite a bit, which was pointed out to me by a you know f- former Hamilton player. Okay. I went back and, and rewatched some of the game, and it's definitely true. And and they you know they were taking advantage of of some of that, and it almost looked like the old uh, um, with Alex Gibbs. Um, uh, zone blocking Denver Broncos oh, okay. type, uh, gotcha. type, you know, one cut and you know get your eight nine yards and and that was really what Hamilton was doing. Nick Arve uh, came into the game with 190 yards rushing, and he looked like a legitimate dual threat in this game. Like he, this wow. was probably the best rushing performance that of his had? career. Okay. They were running a lot of these you know read option sets, and he would he you know he when he would pull the ball, it's because he he knew that he could. Get going. There was one point when he took off running, and Malik Reed just absolutely destroyed him. <laughs> I mean, Malik Reed was hitting everybody with a violence that I've, you know, uh, it is sure. rare to see it in Arizona high school football. Um, and uh, and a couple of plays later, Arve pulled the ball in and, and ran for a long touchdown after getting destroyed. And so um, he played with a lot of guts. He played with a lot of efficiency. Um, he wasn't just safe. He made some of the big throws. Brendan Rice, at times, looked like an um, absolute man among boys. And Brendan Rice also, at times, got blown up by this uh-huh. Chandler defense, this incredibly physical Chandler defense. Um, you know, Gunnar Maldonado made a huge play in this game, you know, playing the ball and not getting freaked out that Brendan Rice was, you know, running right up to him. And, you know, and he, he had a really, really big interception. Um, but for the most part, Hamilton was really able to control what what you know Chandler was doing um, defensively. They mounted very long drives. Um, that's, it seems that way. That's the one thing that seemed like that was a key for the Huskies yeah. on Friday night: long, lengthy, time-consuming drives. Yeah, and then probably the the what, the thing that felt like it really swung the game in uh, Hamilton's favor was that the the momentum was clearly on Chandler's side, and they were marching down to probably tie the game up at 21 right before halftime. And uh, Mikey Keene, who played very, very well and really grew up in this game, especially toward the end, um, you know, he he was leaning a little bit on some of the snaps early, and he leaned back a little bit too much, and there's just a really bad snap to his left and low, and he wasn't able to oh. grab it in time because he was already sort of in motion. Alex Wheeler picks it up. Runs it back for a touchdown. All of a sudden, it's 28-14 going into the half when it was supposed to be, tied. you know, sure. tied. And so, um, you know, and, and when when Hamilton got up 35-21, you know, you had you were kind of wondering what it was that, that Chandler was going to do. And that's when Mikey Keene turned it on. But you brought up Isaiah Collison. I think he came into the game with a couple of catches. And I, I doubled his entire season production just that's in this crazy. game. Um he was, you know, because Jalen Richmond I didn't really show up until the fourth quarter on the very final drive where they took the lead. Um, he he had two very, very – or I think with the, the drive where they tied the game, he had two very, very big catches. But before that, it was all Isaiah Collison. And Chandler always does this, right? They always have somebody break out mm-hmm. super, yeah, we just, super yes. late in the season that we don't – know about we've talked about it on this podcast endless times you know i was laughing at the fact that uh you know we, everyone talked about Braden Lybrock as like this great four-star tight end but the truth is he hadn't really done anything until the last five six games of his True. junior year That's right. and then he exactly. appears out of nowhere and the same with Jarrett Caldwell and the same with Micah Reed Campos you know uh-huh. Isaiah Collison's that guy now and you just have another person um another person to to worry about uh and i think the the other player that stood out to me um in this game was hamilton's uh, dylan mcginnis okay uh, I, th- I think that he is evolving into a very Serious very offensive formidable threat. offensive lineman yeah like, big he, kid big yep, boy he was blocking people in the open field he was pushing the line he was recovering quickly uh, he was getting his arms into guys chests and just opening running lanes that's and, big uh, when you said that he's blocking guys in the open field because yeah 
any offensive lineman can block when there's a scrum going on. You're just yeah. using brute strength. But when you've got a guy one-on-one -on -one away from the ball, away from the line of scrimmage, you can handle him and open up a hole, that's great. And then the other guy uh, was Brady Shuck. Brady yeah. Shuck was everything for that team. Um, hey, he had a very, very special game. He plays on both sides of the ball. And I, without Brady Shuck, I mean, I know that Nick Arve played well, and I know that you know that that, that the running backs and, and Dylan McGinnis and, and and Hamilton's defense played relatively well. Without Brady Shuck, Chandler wins this game by three touchdowns. Wow! Okay. I mean, he was he was the, those especially in the second half. He was making open field tackles and then turning around making one handed catches and and that's big. He was also in motion on every single play, so they had to account for him all of the time, even more than Brendan Rice. And so, uh, but definitely. By far the best performance of Brady Shuck's career. Good stuff. Very good stuff. Chandler has not met Chaparral since September 4th, 2015. They were 22 to 10 winners. They've got the top seed, Chaparral the eighth seed. Hamilton is the seventh seed. They are playing at number two centennial, as we said. Could be a collision course, but there is a lot of work to do. More podcasts, certainly between now and then, that's for sure. Chili, Ralph, Brett, we're out.